Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain an action, drama, sci-fi film called Predestination. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. An agent in a coat and hat is walking in a hallway. He carries with him two briefcases as he heads over to a staircase leading under the building. There he finds a hidden time bomb, to which he immediately opens his briefcase that turns out to be a gadget. The agent carefully disarms the bomb but is interrupted by the presence of another person in the area. The agent pulls his gun and looks for the enemy. Suddenly, the enemy takes him by surprise and lands a shot at the agent. The agent retaliates, but the time bomb is about to explode, so he immediately drops his guard and puts the bomb in the gadget. But just before he could conceal it, the bomb explodes, burning the man's face and knocking him back. The burned agent screams in agony and tries to reach for his other case. The other person finally shows himself to the burning man but, instead, he helps him reach the other case. The two briefly stare at each other before the other person walks away. The burning man then desperately inputs something in the case and enters it. After the event, the agent finds himself covered with bandages, recovering on a hospital bed. His superiors meet him and commend him for his efforts. They tell him that he should forget about his failed mission and focus on resting and preparing for his last mission. It turns out the person he was trying to catch is a very elusive criminal, known as the Fizzle Bomber. The Fizzle Bomber has had many small attacks, but those were nothing compared to the bomber's grand plan, a massive scale attack in New York somewhere in 1975, killing many people. Despite being told to move on his failed mission, the agent is more determined to stop the Fizzle Bomber one more time. After a couple of rests, the doctor finally removes the agent's bandages, telling him that he will recover sufficiently for his next mission. The doctor further instructs the agent that his recovered face and vocal cords will change drastically due to the injuries he suffered. The agent takes a look at the mirror to see his scarred but different face. The agent acknowledges and accepts his changes. Seven years of rest later, the man's face has finally fully healed. He takes his voice recorder and starts recording his experiences. He explains that he is finally about to deploy for his next and final mission. He further explains the importance of his mission and how it will get them closer to their final destination. While the agent prepares, his superiors give him his weapons and remind him of the rules. They tell him that if he diverts from his mission, it will result in death by lethal injection. The agent agrees to all this, and they give him the case from earlier. After everything is said and done, he departs for his final mission. In a city bar in the middle of the night, the agent works undercover as a bartender, seemingly waiting for someone to arrive. A person in a coat and hat then walks into the bar and immediately orders a drink. The bartender serves the person while subtly trying to make conversation. They talk about the fizzle bomber for a short while but immediately escalates into a different conversation. The person reveals himself as a writer, the unmarried mother, and writes confession stories for a living. The bartending man knows about the content he writes and shows him one of the magazines he's been reading. The writer is surprised that a bartending man reads his content because he doesn't fit the demographic. The writer further tells him that the things he writes are not worth the read. The bartender tells him that he sometimes looks to his magazines when he needs insights into a woman's perspective and is curious how a man would know a woman's perspective. The writer tells the bartender that he was once a girl, which leaves the bartender surprised. But before the bartender could ask more about the matter, the writer starts telling his life story. It all started on September 13, 1945. He was a newborn without parents taken and left at an orphanage doorstep. The orphanage took her in and gave her the name Jane. As a kid, Jane was curious about outer space and grew to love it. Jane envied kids who had parents, wondering how and what it feels. Jane never understood why her parents abandoned her or what she did wrong to deserve such deprivation. But as Jane got older, she felt something different about her. Jane was more self-aware than any other girls in the orphanage and more curious than them. Jane solemnly vowed that her children would have a real family, unlike her. So she focused on other things like learning how to fight. Jane was stronger than any of the other kids, even the boys. She was also the smartest in the class. She loved mathematics and science, and everything was easy for her. But all of the kids did not like her, and they thought of her as weird. Later on, Jane grew to hate herself, realizing that her being different made her very unlikely to be adopted. Jane accepted that no one would take her as their daughter or even as their wife. Years later, Jane was finally about to graduate when she met Mr. Robertson. Robertson was looking for young women like Jane for a job in government service on an organization called Space Corp, possibly revolving around space travel. Robertson elaborated that they sought out ladies that show great potential in the fields of mathematics and science and had strong physical abilities. Jane accepted the invitation and applied for the company. During the interview, Jane expressed herself in front of the panel. Upon being questioned by the panel about how she saw her role in the journey, she told them her determination. She was serious about what the organization wants from her, so she got accepted. Space Corp held special training sessions for the volunteers to test if they were capable of space travel. They gave Jane and the volunteers an advanced visual simulation of space. Jane felt alive and was brimming with excitement at the sight of space travel, but some of the volunteers couldn't take it. Space Corp gave them endurance and written tests, which many of the volunteers struggled with, but Jane quickly passed with flying colors. Space Corp also held interviews with a heartbeat sensing machine to tell if the interviewee was lying or not. There they find out that Jane thought about love a lot. Jane also expressed that something feels wrong with her and that the other volunteers don't like her. 
Shortly after, Jane got herself into a fight with one of the volunteers, but she beats the girl by constant parries and multiple strong punches directly to the face, knocking her down. They were immediately stopped by the staff and taken to the clinic. Outside, a doctor hands a report to Robertson about something particular in Jane's body. The doctor then told Robertson that it would disqualify her, but Robertson told the doctor not to tell Jane and that he'll take care of it. Jane got disqualified, but they didn't tell her why. While packing her things, Robertson approached her, and Jane expressed to him that she was merely defending herself. Robertson reassures Jane that he will do everything to get her back in the program. Despite Robertson's promise, Jane couldn't rely on him, so she had to find other ways to make a living. Jane worked as a house helper in the day for a cheap family by doing their chores. It was there that Jane discovered confession story magazines and began to love reading them for her pastime. At night, Jane went to school to work on her etiquette, but she had a hard time learning. That was when Jane met the man who was going to change her life. One rainy night, Jane accidentally bumped into a man and apologized. Jane then asked if the man was lost, to which the man replied that he was waiting for someone. Jane replied with the quote, good things happen to those who wait. The man replied with the rest of the quote, saying, but only the things left behind by those who hustle. Jane was amazed that they were thinking the same thing. Jane further describes the man to the bartender, how the man was handsome and rich enough to take care of her. Jane was in love with how the man treated her, and the bartender replies mockingly, seemingly knowing how it ends. Jane asks the bartender if he had ever done something stupid for love, to which the bartender replies that he did, once, and he understands how Jane felt. Jane continues her story, telling the bartender that being with that man was the happiest time of her life. But it only lasted there. The man told Jane to wait at the bench. The man promised Jane that he'd be back. But the man never returned. Jane tells the bartender that she acknowledges the relationship is nothing more than a flame. So she was able to move on quickly and continued hoping to go back to Space Corporation. Then one day, Robertson visited Jane. Robertson told Jane the truth that the organization he was working for was not for space travel. It was a confidential government agency that reshapes wrongdoings and only used Space Corp to find extraordinary people. People who had exceptional abilities, people who had no families, no past and ties to the future, people like Jane. Jane tells the bartender that she didn't understand what the job meant, but she knew it would change her life for the better. Until she realized she was pregnant and Robertson never appeared to her again. It turns out that the mysterious man left Jane with more than just a broken heart, and she thought her future was over. Jane went to a charity ward with other pregnant women, though she felt alone. One night, Jane found herself in agony on an operating table with nurses and doctors, ready to finally let the baby out. In the morning after the operation, Jane woke up, and a doctor came to check in on her. The doctor happily informs the excited Jane that the cesarean was successful and the baby was a healthy little girl. But then everything took a turn when the doctor started to ask Jane if any doctors ever told her about the state of her body. Confused, Jane told him that the doctors never told her anything and that everything was fine. The doctor then explains to Jane that she had two reproductive organs, female and male, inside of her. Despite being underdeveloped, the female set was good enough to develop a baby. Then the doctor tells her that due to excessive bleeding from birth, they were forced to perform a hysterectomy on her, removing her female reproductive organs. However, they were able to reconstruct her successfully, and she was able to develop her male reproductive parts, though she will have to take more surgeries. Jane was shocked by the news, gets teary, and unable to accept what happened. The doctor continues to reassure her that she will be fine. Jane continues to care for her baby daughter, telling her that she was the best thing that ever happened to her. When asked by a nurse about the baby's name, Jane wanted to name her baby after herself. Jane was now very determined to raise the baby properly. However, the baby was kidnapped, taken away from the hospital nursery by an older man. Jane desperately tried everything, but she never found her baby, and they never found the kidnapper. Then there was her other problem. Jane had to undergo three major operations and spent 11 months in the hospital to reshape her into a man. Everything made her feel broken, as she was losing herself in the process. 11 months later, Jane looked in the mirror and saw her new self, finally accepting that the girl he once was, is truly gone. Jane tells the bartender that every time he looked at the mirror, it reminded him of the person that ruined his life. Jane desperately tries to re-enlist on Space Corp once more but to no success. They knew about his story and marked him unfit for space travel, nailing the coffin to her desired future. So Jane changed his name and moved to New York to get on with his life. He started trying to make a living, eventually leading to his current career of being the unmarried mother, writing confession stories for a living. Jane concludes the story with that. Strangely enough, the bartender then asks Jane a question, that if she had the opportunity to kill the man, would she do it? Jane answered that she would, in a heartbeat. So the bartender starts telling Jane that he knows the person and he can make him do it. Jane doesn't trust him, so the bartender uncovers Jane's current name that she did not even mention, which is John. John is still reluctant, so the bartender reassures him that he works for Robertson, which finally prompts John to follow him. The agent takes him down the cellar and shows him his field kit, telling him that it is a time machine, and they will both travel back in time. John is still suspicious of the bartender until the agent stands close to him and tells him to stay still, hold the case, and close her eyes, and the two of them disappear from the cellar. John and the agent travel to Cleveland, Ohio, in 1963. 
John is distorted from the travel but slowly recovers. The agent gives John some cash and clothes for the mission while briefing him of where the man is. John is still perplexed, but the agent tells him that the man who ruined his life might be the fizzle bomber. The agent then reassures him that if he kills the man, he can finally get the job. The agent then leaves John to do his mission. That rainy night, the disguised John makes his way on the fateful hallway where the man was supposed to meet his past self. Suddenly, he bumps into a girl and looks away from her. The girl asks if she was lost, to which John replies that he was waiting for someone. The girl then tells him the quote, good things happen to those who wait. John finally pieces the puzzle together, realizing he was the man all along and replied with the rest of the quote. John turns around to meet Jane and is astounded at the sight of her. John wholeheartedly compliments Jane telling her that she's beautiful and someone should have told her that. Jane replies with a smile that he just did. All while this is happening, the agent watches them from a distance and shortly leaves. The agent deviates back to his failed mission. But this time, he spots the fizzle bomber who just finished setting up the bomb. The bomber notices the agent and dodges his first shot. The two get in a short gunfight, but the bomber makes a run for it. The agent chases him but finds himself in a dark part of the basement. The agent slowly searches for the bomber, but the bomber flanks him, and the two get in a short fist fight. The bomber beats him with a solid punch to the face and knocks him down. Shortly after, the agent hears familiar gunshots, prompting him to get back on his feet and head over to the bomb. There he sees his past self the moment he burned his face. The agent approaches the agonizing former him and helps him reach his field kit, and the two gaze at each other briefly. The former agent time travels away from the scene. The agent realizes the inevitability of his failure. He then picks up a part of the bomb, takes it with him, and time travels away. The agent jumps to 1964 and takes out his anger. He cleans, recollects, and reminds himself of the next part of his mission while recording everything. Back in 1963, John and Jane go out for coffee. Jane starts the conversation by telling John that she isn't a friendly person. John knows this very well, so he frankly tells Jane the reason why. Jane is amazed at how similar they view other people, that they feel more superior to others. Jane asks John what makes him feel superior to other people. John wittingly replies that he can read minds, and this prompts Jane to let him read hers. John begins to tell her the truth about herself, her struggles, and her thoughts about love. Jane denies this at first but slowly starts falling for John. John then sympathizes with how Jane's life has been and tells her how he relates a lot to how she feels. The two continue to enjoy conversing with one another and eventually made out. The agent is now in a hospital hallway when Robertson appears to meet him. The agent gives Robertson the piece of the bomb, to which he realizes that the agent made an illegal jump. Robertson, however, tolerates this saying that agents without the regulations could save more lives. The agent expresses his hesitation about the next task, saying that Jane will endure so much pain because of what he's about to do. Robertson explains why the agent has to accomplish his mission, to preserve the existence of an agent created by a predestination paradox, a person with no ancestry in history, like John. Robertson reassures the agent that he's doing the right thing and leaves. The nurse then exits the ward, and the agent proceeds to take Jane's baby. The agent takes the baby to his place and prepares the baby for time travel. The agent inputs the date, September 13, 1945, and carefully takes the baby with him and travels. The agent changes his clothes and takes the baby to the orphanage doorstep, where it all started. The agent wishes the baby well, calling her both of the names John and Jane. The agent then phones the orphanage to notify them of the baby at the doorstep, completing the cycle. The agent returns to Cleveland, Ohio 1963, and sees John and Jane at the bench from a distance. John notices the agent, so he tells Jane to wait for him and makes his way to the agent. Feeling very deceived, John pulls out his gun towards the agent. The agent understands his pain but still tells him that everything was inevitable. John tells the agent that he genuinely loves Jane, which the agent acknowledges. The agent then makes everything finally clear to John, who Jane is supposed to become, who she is now, and who the agent is. John is speechless after finally making sense of everything, so the agent reassures him that everything is proceeding correctly. John looks at Jane one more time, not wanting to leave her, but finally accepts what has to happen. The agent takes John to the headquarters and tells him that he will finally lead a good life from there. John gets exhausted from the jump, so the nurses take him for recovery. The agent and Robertson speak outside. Robertson explains that for John to become the person who will prevent crimes, he had to endure his entire life first. The agent still worries about the fizzle bomber running amok. To this, Robertson tells him that the fizzle bomber helped the agency become stronger. The agent is surprised at this remark. Robertson then hands him the timer and new leads against the fizzle bomber. Robertson then instructs the agent that after he reaches his final destination, his field kit will decommission as per regulation. The agent acknowledges this, so Robertson pats him, and the two bid each other farewell. The agent leaves his recorded messages behind beside John and leaves. The agent then jumps to his final destination in New York 1975, few months before the grand explosion. The agent settles down, relaxing on a chair, waiting for his kit to decommission. But to his surprise, the kit fails to decommission. The agent then checks the new lead Robertson left him and finds out that Robertson still wants him to find the fizzle bomber. Meanwhile, the agent looks for a typewriter and finds it in an antique store. He buys the typewriter and starts writing a novel. Upon finishing the novel, the agent reveals himself to be John all along, 
and the novel he wrote was about his own entire life. Shortly after, John begins connecting the dots and clues about the fizzle bomber and comes to a horrible conclusion. He then picks up his gun and makes his way. At the laundromat, John barges in with his gun to find an older version of himself as the fizzle bomber. John is heavily disappointed at what he has become, but the bomber justifies that all he did was prevent deaths by killing some. John tells the bomber about the lives he destroyed. He then angrily tells the bomber that he will never become him. However, the bomber tells him that it is inevitable for John to become the fizzle bomber, for it was already predestined like their entire lives. He further explains that if John kills him, he will become the next bomber. The bomber then finally tells him that the only way to break the paradox is not to kill him but, instead, love him again. But John, without hesitation, shoots the bomber and kills him mercilessly. Everything finally fits in place. The paradox will continue to happen in a repeating cycle. The baby, the young Jane, the adult John, the unmarried mother, the mysterious lover, and the agent were all the same person born out of predestination. And now, as the newly recruited agent John turns to the next page of his predestined life, so is the time for decommissioned John to make his next predestined move. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.